How's it going? Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Never we've met before, have we? No, nah, just just uh, just me watching you on TV. <laughs> big fan, big yeah. fan. I'm a big fan of athletics, as it goes. Thank you, Thank you very much. How's it been for you? How's, how's locking down? Um, it was a little bit difficult at first because, um, you know, I've spent most of my life being outside. Mm. And, you know, um, most of my work is outside. I don't, I don't stay indoors. <laughs> yeah. So it was yeah. a bit hard because I had quite a few things in the pipeline and then, um, you know, everything was cancelled and, and you're kind of thinking, well, that's my life. <laughs> What am I going to do? So it took a while to adjust, but um, I'm actually enjoying it now. I prefer, I think I found something that I'm happy with. I, I like staying indoors. I'm a homebody anyway. So am I. And I've got quite a big family, so it's not, it's not been too difficult, I don't yeah. think. It's, it's like me. A lot, a lot of my work is kind of, you know, involves being outside and around a lot of people. But generally, if I'm not doing that, I'm, you just find me at home. Yeah. It's, I mean, it took a while <laughs> and also I was actually renovating my home I was redecorating so that kind of kept me busy for the first like three weeks of lockdown yeah so um so now my home is like how I like it so I actually don't mind <laughs> okay. I don't mind staying at home now so I, I can understand how people did struggle I really I really I really understand if people really did struggle during yeah. lockdown. I've been asking some people I've been speaking to like um has music played a part in like a you know, getting you through your lockdown, what music do you listen to uh, to relax or or whatever, or to think or to switch off? Um. That's an interesting question because I retired last year, but then I, I graduated from uni last year as well. And the period from graduation up until now is like the first time that I've, I've had off, like no, nothing, no study, no training, yeah. nothing. Yeah. I can literally do what I like, when I like. And that's been the first time since I've been I don't know, say 14. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, so I've, I've literally just been decluttering everything. Mm -hmm. And then one well, thing I realised I hadn't touched, which was the, 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 the sacred place, which I just never touched, was my iTunes library. <laughs> like, I always add, but I never take anything out. So I had about near, near enough 8,000 songs that I'd just been collecting over, over <laughs> the decades. And that's the one thing, the music I just don't touch. But I thought, you no, know, considering I'm decluttering, let me just try and get rid of, you know, I said a lot of these songs I probably don't listen to anyway. So um, I've been going through my iTunes and I think I've just been trying to understand what different music um, had a place when and why. And it was bringing back different stories of different races, different competitions, different parts of the world. Um, so it's been quite interesting because that's been a journey that I think started at the start of lockdown. And it's kind of still continuing now. I mean, I have a lot of songs to get through, <laughs> but I just put it on a random playlist. It just plays everything at some point. And um, so a lot, the of, of late, I've been playing loads of um, Cuban music because I love salsa. Ah, okay. Yeah, a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of. I was in Brazil in January and I, and I, yeah, went to one <laughs> salsa club yeah. and uh, yeah, I had a go and I uh, discovered a lot of new music as well. So, okay. Yeah, so that's opened up a whole new door. Mm. I'm definitely into Afro beats, which I've always been okay. um, interested in. But I think my, my, my tastes are very, very eclectic. Very, very. I mean, it kind of, it's like everything that stemmed from um, like Soulful House. So all the offshoots <laughs> of, of Soulful House. But I listen to, I mean, if you listen, if you looked at my iTunes now, it's 8,000. So actually, to be, tell a lie, I've, ta I've taken it down to about 6,000 now. Now, I mean, think just, you know, involved in your sport, the amount of travel and, you know, being on a plane and then stuck in hotels and then actually music for training and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I didn't really think how it could play a part, but we're going to get back to the travel. I do definitely want to touch on okay. that. Um, I just wanted to know where you, I know where you're from, but say where you're from. And obviously you're a, you're a Newham resident, like, a, like I, I was growing up. What does it mean to you being from Newham and how was it growing up there? So I was born and raised in Newham. I still live in Newham. My family still live here. I'm one of eight kids. Oh. And I'm the second oh. oldest, yeah. Is it Stratford? So, yeah, yeah. Born and raised in Stratford. Um, I think I was born in Forest Gate Hospital. So me and my older brother were born in Forest Gate, which is now knocked down. It's, I think it's flat. 
And then the rest of my siblings are all born in um, Newham General. And we all still live in Newham, so. <laughs> um, I went to primary school in Newham, but my secondary school took me out of Newham into Essex. I, was, I went to school in Rockford. You know, it was just home. I didn't really see it as anything negative. Stratford was Stratford. Mm-hmm. I had a great time. Um, me and my brother, we spent a lot of time outdoors. And um, we're fortunate that we lived in between um, two parks. So we lived in between um, West Ham Park, which I actually went back there a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago. So it's nice to go back. So we lived in between West Ham Park and um, the recreation ground. Okay. So we okay. were always out and about um, playing. We had loads of spaces to playing. My mum didn't particularly like us going to West Ham Park because she said it was too far. I mean. <laughs> So we always were at Stratford Rec, but we always had loads of um, spaces to run around with. And that was home. It wasn't anything to, to feel a certain way about. I think I probably started realising that Stratford wasn't all that <laughs> when I went to school in Romford. And then I realised that Romford had like an ice skating ring, really big shopping mall. And all my friends had big gardens. And it just seemed like another world. And I think it was from that point I... I didn't really like to um, say that I was from Stratford anymore. Um, I really had a hard time inviting my friends over to, you know, the East End because they were just used to a different world and I just didn't think that they would appreciate where I'd, where I'd come from. I think one of my friends did come and visit, but that was probably, I didn't think I had many friends that came around because it just, there was just nothing to do. I didn't, I really didn't... Um, I suppose I didn't really like it that much anymore when I realised that other people had things <laughs> a lot better, <laughs> a lot better than what I had. But I think it's probably gone full circle now where I actually do, I mean, I'm still back in Newham, not quite in Stratford, my family still live in Stratford, but I live maybe about 10 minutes away. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think I've gone full circle now where I'm back to that place where I, you know, I, I actually do like my time now. <laughs> That's amazing. At, at what point did... Um... Did yeah, you, you you give the innocent life up of just being out and about and going to the ice skating rink in Romford to fully fledged training and uh, give your life over to athletics? Was it a, a really young age? No, not really. So uh, what people don't always know is that before athletics, I was a netball player. So I played netball for England under 17 and under 19. So I didn't start track until I was but. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's a bit confusing because they both were at the same time. <laughs> so I was playing netball while I was starting track and I had actually won um, a bronze medal for Great Britain um, while I was still playing netball for England. So I was doing both at the same time. Um, but I, I definitely quit England netball 2002. Mm-hmm. But I didn't quit netball. I just quit England netball 2002. So that made me about 18. And then, um, then I, my coach persuaded me to, to train more. Because the thing is, I was doing everything at the same time. And then my track coach was, was getting upset because he's like, Chris, I, I only see you once a fortnight. <laughs> if I'm going to train, you, you need to come all the time. I can't keep losing you to netball. And then I think I, I got, and I think I was studying at the same time and I was working and it's, there's just not enough hours in the day. So, um, I think uh, I decided that my dream was always to play for England and I've done that now. So let me try this track thing. I don't know how, if I'll be any good at it. I wasn't actually that good, but my coach believed that I could, I could do well. So I thought, let me just give it a try. Let me try something new. And so that started from like 19. Nine, I think maybe 19, 19 I had quit netball, England netball. And then, uh, so I was 19 May 2000 and one 2003 I was 19 and then 2004 I made the Olympic team so that was 20 at that age so it's yeah. all kind of mixed together. Netball was kind of yeah. your first love and your passion in sport but someone else saw a potential in you. What I've been trying to find out from a lot of people as well is like um, yeah. who was it um, that really nurtured their talent or you know what I mean kind of you know, help help them, push them in the right direction kind of thing. You know what I mean? But it seems like that coach yeah. really saw something in you. Or was there anyone else that really, you know, done that for you? Um, I think I have been lucky that I just had good people around. I mean, they weren't always the people that were the, 
um, ones, they weren't always the gurus, but they're just people that just spotted something. Mm. And I don't think I would have had the confidence to have done it myself had I not have said anything. So the reason I got onto track was because my teacher at school, when I was running in sports days, he just made an innocent comment like, he says, oh, you look like, you know, do you run for a running club? And I said, no. And he goes, you look like you've been coached. Mm. And I think um, a friend of mine overheard at the time. He's like, oh, yeah, I run for Neumonetics Beagles. You should come and join us. Mm. So it was just that little interaction that made me think, oh, I can become an athlete. I can become quicker. I can be better at netball if I, if I run faster. So it's almost like people just sowed seeds and then I just ran away with it. So um, that's how I got into track. And then in netball, um, it was just like teammates and coaches who just kind of kept pushing me along, just give you small pointers. I'm not the kind of person that needs to be um, handheld through anything. Mm-hmm. I just need a little, just, just show me, just give me an opening. <laughs> just, yeah. just even if you just open a door a crack, I'll figure out the rest myself. Yeah. And that's most, yeah. I think people realize that, you know, just plant an idea, then she'll go, <laughs> just set her up. And then she's, you know, you don't have to worry about her afterwards. Yeah. And, but I think track was probably a little bit harder because my coach was trying to pull me away from something that I loved. I love netball. I've been playing netball since I was like eight, nine. I loved it. That was my first and only passion. Track was something that came later. Um, but I, I think he did encourage me to leave netball because he just said, you know, you could be good at 400. I didn't think is I didn't see it. I, I didn't think I was that good. I thought I was okay. I knew that I worked hard, but um, I didn't know how far I could go. I really didn't know. A track was still very, very new. It wasn't like I grew up watching track. I grew up knowing 400 meter runners. Yeah. I didn't grow up understanding how things were supposed to be. I was just going on his word. But I don't know, it's something I, I, you know, I liked my coach, we got on well, and I don't know, I trusted him that he knew what he was talking about. So I suppose I was willing to, suppose, take that risk and try something. You know, the thing is with me, I'm not, I'm not adverse to trying something new. Even if I fall on my face, I would still give it a try. It's that curiosity, isn't it? It's interesting what you're saying, because it's like with me, like music's my thing, but I also started acting and, and, and it wasn't my first love, but people are like, you, you, are you going to act more? You should act more and all of that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm a bit, yeah. And I was talking to Idris and obviously he, you know, he lived in Newham as well. And he, actually, I think he ran for Newham and Essex Beagles or something like that. He like, was really, yeah, he like really wanted to be an athlete. Um, and, and, and he was saying, it's like, that's cool, but at, at a point, if it's really going to be something you do, you have to take the jump, you know what I mean? You have to really take that jump with confidence and just immerse yourself in, in a new world. Until, and until you're ready to do that, you know what I mean? It's not really going to happen. So, so to hear you say, you're, cause there must have been a point where you really took that jump and kind of left yeah. netball behind and you, yeah. you already said you achieved one of your goals anyway. But there must have been a time where it was like, okay, this is what I love. Yeah. Because can you get to the can you get to where you got to without really loving something? Yeah, no, you're right. The first step was getting rid of netball, <laughs> closing the door, and um, not just physically closing the door by telling them I'm not coming back, but mentally telling myself that this is this is over now. This is. Um, this is not your path anymore. And the thing is, I never saw that. I always thought I was going to go all the way right through to the senior mm-hmm. ranks of that. Well, I didn't see anything else. So, yeah, you physically, you, you know, I made the call. One of the hardest phone calls I've ever made in my life was to the netball, head netball coach at the time, tell her I wasn't coming back. And she was devastated. But I think she, when she said that um, she knew that she was going to lose me to track, I thought, okay, I've made the right decision. Yeah. She said that eventually uh, we knew we were going to lose you. And then that's when I thought, okay, so these guys saw it before I did that I was going to go at some point. So it didn't make it feel as bad. So um, you, when you close a physical door, you have to close a mental door. And, and it's scary to open a new door. You know, netball, I was very comfortable. I, I knew where I was going. I knew I, I could, you know, make it through the ranks. That was my goal. And then to start something where I was at least a second and a half, two seconds behind the the my peers I wasn't 
you know, I wasn't, I was average, but the girls who were very good were very good. <laughs> so, um, and that was another, um, almost another hurdle that I had to try and, and, um, and, and deal with was starting from behind. Yeah. Um, but I suppose in a way it wasn't really too bad because um, it, in my life I'd always started from behind. Even when I started playing club netball, I wasn't on the same level pegging as my peers. They'd been start, they played club netball from early. And club netball is very different to school netball. It's a lot quicker, there's more accuracy, all those kind of things. Um, so I wasn't really too worried about that. Um, um, I think when my coach set a goal, which was the, the fact that the Olympics are next year, so that, uh, that was in 2004. And I remember my coach saying, you know, we can try and make you, um, we can try and get you on a relay team for the Olympics. And that's when I thought, okay, this is, this is serious now. <laughs> yeah. um, this was, uh, it wasn't just, oh, I'm just turning up because I enjoy doing it, which is, I mean, I did, but there was a reason for me for my coach investing so much time in me. There's a reason why he, yeah. he wanted me to leave netball to fully focus on track. And that's because, you know, big things are happening. <laughs> Olympics is not any small DBDB competition, you know. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you about, you know, um, how important visualization is before execution even. You know, I, I wondered if you was a person that could, you know, visualize something and then go for it, you know what I mean? I think my first um, four range of visualization would have been in at those Olympics, 2004, because um, I remember my coach wasn't able to actually come to the games. He could come to the holding camp, where was where we did our pre-training, but he actually couldn't physically come to the to the Olympic. He didn't have accreditation to actually come to the games, so he had to go home. And so I was completely on my own. <laughs> my first ever major championship, and I, you know, I had no one. I had a couple of teammates, but I think I was probably one of the youngest ones on the team at the time as well. And I was, it's probably the newest. I hadn't had all the experiences that other people had had. I hadn't gone through English schools. I hadn't, you know, uh, I hadn't done all that stuff. I hadn't done world champs. Uh, so the Olympics was, was pretty much a baptism of fire. And I remember at the time I was training and I was just so scared all the time. <laughs> and it, at the time, the psychologist, um, he asked me what the problem was and I just said, oh, it's just, you know, it's the Olympics and it's such a big deal and I'm by myself and I don't know how to do it and I'm scared. And he said, just imagine that you're back at mile end training. So yeah. Just imagine it's exactly the same track, the same eight lanes, it's the same distance. There's nothing different um, between running at an Olympic stadium and running at mile end in East London. Rainy, cold, East London, there's no different. And that was my, that was what saved me. That exactly what, because I could, all I had to think about was running at mile end, which I could do very well. I did it every single day. It was nothing different, just that there was more people and they were just a bit noisier. <laughs> yeah. And he said, yeah. all you're doing is something ordinary, but you're doing it on an extraordinary day. And that's the one thing that saved me through the game. So that my first round, I ran a personal best, I ran 50.5, which was the fastest uh, time run, run by Brit in... I can't remember how many years. Yeah. Um, so that was it. That was, that was all I needed. And all I had to do was picture, you know, set a picture in my, my mind, which was running at my end. And that was it. And I think there were many other instances where I had to use visualization. I think probably one that was, one where I really did use visualization in earnest was in 2013, World Champs in Moscow. And where we actually set about... Um, running the British record. That was what the plan was. Yeah. And so we, you know, leading up to Moscow, so from about, you know, probably from the start of the training season, which would have been the year before in October, yeah. we were working on visualization and what it was going to look like and how we we're going to run um, in Moscow. And, you know, we actually had a definite goal, which was to run a British record. And so, so visualization was something that, um, I managed to really hone in on and use really productively and it actually did work really well. You, you said about the psychology. Who, who brought a psychologist in? Was that a part of the GB team or something that you done personally? At the time, I remember that was a GB uh, psychologist. Um, his name was Dave Collins, who actually became our performance director okay. for athletics after that. I think now every team will have their own specific 
uh, team psychologist. Is it become more normalised in the sport now? Because I've, I've yeah. got some mates that play football and he told me once when he was going through a bad period, um, he spoke to the sports psychologist and it really helped. Like He didn't really believe it was going to be something that would help. Yeah. And he was shocked at you know how much um, that helped him. But yeah. it was like new in football at the time, you know what I mean? It's like these kind of things and how things are evolving. You, you, yeah, you, you kind of... You don't realise how much of a, uh, an importance that could be. Just It's as much mental as it, it's physical, right? Yeah, I think um, what people tend to not... Sorry, my brother just brought my neck. How is he? I think people don't realise that, that, you know, sport... Well, I think for most things, most things, the mental takes precedent. Mm. I definitely yeah. think his sport... I mean, they take percentages, you know, sport, sport is 10% physical, 90% mental. I don't know what the percentage is, but I know for a fact that if your head isn't right, turn the TV off. Sorry. <laughs> Love this. <laughs> All in the edit. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> Bust a little switch there, I like it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely, mental is the one that is the most important. And I think um, if you talk to athletes, I think, I, I think when you look at um, even how our, our competitions are set up, the fact that you have to, you know, you have your, 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 your warm up, and then from the warm up, they'll take you into a call room. And then from that, like call room number one, they'll take you to call room number two. Mm. And then you get onto the track. So you have all these different things to navigate before you actually get out into, into oh, running. Okay. And if you're not mentally strong, they say that the race is won or lost in the call room. If you're seeing your competitors and you have to sit in, you know, you have to sit next to each other and mm. you're, you're watching each other, you'll probably be there for five minutes, 10 minutes sometimes. And then you go to another call room and you have to stand next to each other and you're looking at the person you want to beat or he wants to beat you or this or that. And then you have to go onto the track and try and collect yourself. Yeah. And then you have the yeah. stadium of 90,000 people sometimes and you have to do the work and you're all by yourself. You're not, you don't have your coach at that point. You don't have somebody to talk to. You don't have anyone to talk to, but just you and your thoughts. And sometimes you have, and obviously your coach might be someone you want to talk to. I, I feel I, I get the kind, same kind of thing when I'm performing. Um, yeah. And sometimes you've got too much people to talk to though. Um, we haven't got the competition element um, but when you're practicing for a show or when you're doing a sound check for a big show, it's like you're doing a sound check and it's going well when you just wish like, can we start now? Can you bring the people in right now? Because I don't want this break of four hours where everyone feels relaxed and everyone's in their dressing room and chatting. But you, you're kind of being polite, speaking to people, but mentally, you know, you have to still be switched on. You can't switch off because, you know what I mean? It's exactly like that. I mean, some people I'm sure will have a great warm up. And then you think, just run the race now, I'm in good shape. But then you have to wait nearly half an hour yeah. before you actually yeah. get on. And so you have to learn how to manage your, your energy levels. You can't stay completely hyped the whole time because you'll burn yourself out. You can't be completely, but you have to dial down a little bit, <laughs> yeah. but not too much that you get onto the track and you're flat. So uh, it is a mental game. Um, some people will, I think there was one story that someone told me, I can't remember, this was an Olympics quite a few, I think Linford told me this story actually, I can't remember who it was, but um, they, there was a 100 meter final, I'm sure it's in that you can find the, who it was, but it was a 100 meter final and I think one of the athletes went to the toilet and they didn't come back, <laughs> they were so scared they didn't come back to compete, the, the lane was empty. I speak to people about a suffer pal and it's a mystery to me sometimes because, look, you're laughing, it's a mystery because... <laughs> Yeah, look, you probably heard it. You probably can tell me the real juice. But, um, like, people say that he's one of the, you know, technically he's one of the best um, sprinters out there and he just can't do it. He's not really a big game player like that. He just can't do it. And it must be down to, you know, he wouldn't be lining up if he didn't feel good throughout the training season or whatever and wasn't producing some good times. But it's just like he can't do it. I know he has won before and he has broke records before, yeah. but... In the moments where, anyway, I don't want you to draw you into talking about Southern Power, but I did <laughs> want to go back on, on, on one thing that 
that um, time where you said, you, you know, you started training and you were like two seconds behind everyone and, but you knew you had this goal of getting into the Olympics team in front of you. In my opinion, with, um, you know, in, in most, in most walks of life, I guess, you have naturally talented people that yeah. don't have to work as hard as the rest to achieve the same result. And you've got people that have to work super hard just to achieve. you now that doesn't last forever talent alone don't take you there and you know people end up catching up but i was going to ask which one were you but i think you clearly was the one that probably had to work more yeah. you know but like where does that work ethic and discipline that clearly you have come from like where does that come from in your life to to be able to want something and then work for it. Um, is my sound okay, by the way? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. His bonehead has a TV on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't shout at him now, obviously, because, you know, <laughs> so I just stay yeah. polite. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably, I just think it's probably down to a lot of um, my upbringing. I'm, so I'm one of eight kids. I'm the second oldest. Um, I think that's probably has a lot to do with it. So I was always, um, I'm learned, I'm used to juggling loads of things at once. Um, I'm used to being able to manage my time effectively. Um, a little bit chaotic at times because I do happen to juggle a lot. So I think doing the work was never something that was a, was a worry for me. I was, even when I was playing netball, I was, um, having to do some, crazy journey just to get home from school to go up back out to the network which was in back in Essex I'd come from Essex to go home after school then from there I'd go back out to Essex to play netball um I just think it's just my upbringing and I suppose after a while you just you just get on you don't really see it as like I didn't think I was ever doing anything special I just was doing what had to be done and I think that was probably the difference between me and a lot of my peers I didn't really make things a big deal it just you have the goal and you work towards it. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. I was always willing to do the work to get to where I believed I needed to get to. Um, and in, as looking back on it, I didn't, really, I didn't really think much of it. I suppose um, uh, maybe now, if I saw somebody doing that, I would make a big deal of it. But for me, it was just, it was just how life was. Um, you know, we grew up in a big family. There were loads of responsibilities on myself and my brother. And um, I was very much involved in all of their upbringing. As you can see, my brother just went and, you know, brought his boy and just dumped his boy on me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how it is. That's how it's always been. It's always, you. you know, being big sister, come and save us. And um, so that's it. So I think just having mm. a goal, there was nothing unusual i always knew that i worked hard i always knew i can grind that's the one thing that i i'm i'm good at and i think that's it's it's quite telling in even how i run you know how i do my 400 it's just i'm not i'm not phased by people being so far ahead or competitors i'll you know i'll take anyone on it's not an issue but i just think it's just because growing up you have to we had to, I had to work pretty hard so it's not really it's not really a bother for me okay and that that family uh, network that you speak of were they there throughout your career to as your support system i couldn't really get rid of them <laughs> 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 but i think the one thing that i i really did love was the fact that you know no matter what i was just their sister and that was okay. nice and no matter what was it, happening it, anywhere it else. keeps you grounded and, and humble you know yeah and that's that's what i like i mean I, I can I can happily say that every decision I made in my track career was because of them. Like I did everything so that they could um, they could have a better life, they could have opportunities. And I don't regret that at all. I don't regret that. I don't regret um, having that approach, like putting my family first so that they could enjoy um, everything that I was able to achieve. So... Um, yeah, they were there. I mean, they're still here. I can't. My sister lives with me. My brothers live, you know, not too far away. So I hope that they believe that they run this journey with me. Literally, run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really, they're just not sweating. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but it's no, it's been good, and it's been good having them, you know, at all the you know integral, um, important bits they've always been. And like in 2012, they all walked to the stadium. <laughs> That's how close we live, and it's quite funny because in Beijing, because um, it was so expensive to to fly out, we could only fly out two of my brothers to Beijing, and then only two came to Athens. But in London, everybody came. <laughs> Yeah. And they didn't even have to fly anywhere. They could just walk. So that was nice. Before we get to London, speaking of like opportunity, was there ever a time where you thought being black, coming from Newham, there was a lack of opportunity or it was ever going to hold you back in your career? Or was there so many examples of black athletes doing well from not affluent backgrounds that you thought it was possible? I never, ever thought felt like I had any limitations whatsoever. I think I was in such a good training group, which was just so diverse, so mixed up. I think also growing up with an older brother and um, my junior was a brother, it was a boy. So I never had this feeling of um, any kind of gender disparity. Everything my brothers would do, I would join in. I played football with them. I, I'd, you know, I'd run races and beat them. Everything my older brother would do, I would do. And he never felt any way about having his little sister, you know, trudge along with him. Like, so if he was playing out, I would join. If he was going out with his friends, I would join. <laughs> because I, you know, I never really showed that I, I would limit him in any way. So um, with that in mind, I grew up knowing that there was no limitations just because I was a girl. Mm -hmm. and, and I think with sport as well, sports issues, there's no limitations. Because when you make a goal... You're gonna you're gonna try and go for it regardless of anything. So I already had that framework in my mind, and then coming to track um, with a group that was so diverse. You had males, females, black, white, Asian. Um, everybody was just there working. So again, you never really got the feeling that there were any limitations because I was from East London. We trained in my land. People would come from far to come and train with us. Brighton wherever they were coming, you know, train a couple of days and then go back home wherever home was. So there was never a sense that I was anything different or I was anything unusual or there was any kind of limitations. My coach, I think from the time that he said, Chris, you need to do this track thing full time. From the time he said that, for me, that was someone who had belief in me. Yeah. And when yeah. someone has belief in you, there are no limitations. <laughs> There's nothing. You, you can soar as high as you, as you want to soar. So, um, yeah, it was never, I, I'd never really thought anything was an issue. My school in Romford was um, predominantly white um, when I first started. But it just wasn't, it, I, I don't know, I didn't really feel any way about it. I definitely think it's probably because of the way I was brought up where I have very maybe a very high tolerance <laughs> maybe that's what it is but I really wasn't bothered or affected by much I just wanted to just do my sport and I don't know have an easy life I suppose <laughs> yeah yeah but it was never an opportunity I don't think there was any opportunity where I felt like I was being denied of something or I didn't have the same access to something I think my my school um in Romford was you know, they had the best facilities sports-wise. Okay. And I was determined to make, yeah, I, was, I did everything in school. I did, you know, I did trampolining, did rounders, I did tennis, um, did hockey, netball. I didn't do track. <laughs> Believe it or not, I didn't do track, but I did everything else. Yeah, well, I guess when you're in a field where, I guess, you know, you, you can see a direct response to the work you're putting in. So if you work harder, your time will get better and then you know you would, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. in music, it could be, I work hard, but yeah. someone yeah. else just doesn't rate me or yeah. someone else won't yeah. give me this opportunity. It's like, yeah. why I love athletics is there's no debate about it. There's no opinion about it. There's no debate. This was my time. It's not, <laughs> sometimes you look at people like, I'm better than him. In sport, you can't say, in athletics, you can't say that. So, and that's the thing I love about it. That's why I love it. It's such a pure event. It's just basically you run quicker, you throw further, you push quicker, you jump high. That's it. You can't lie with the stats. You yeah. can't lie. Yeah. You can't, yeah. even yeah. if the clock is dodgy, 
uh, you still can't lie because time, you can't lie with time. I guess, you know, when you progress and you need your spikes and you need certain things, cool, I get it. And the 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 ice chamber that they go in afterwards and as, as things progress i get it but at the beginning you can just run you know what i mean you can tra like these sports like formula one where you you know what i mean you need big investment yeah, as a young kid and i had a little cousin that played tennis and it just got too much because they like to yeah. you know fly for different places for tournaments and stay there for ages and it just wasn't and the, the kit was too much but um yeah there is something pure about about sprinting I want to talk to you about 2012, of course, because yeah. like how that's like the dream and like how was that being in Stratford? That meant a lot to me and I'm not an athlete, you know what I mean? Just to see the Olympics in Stratford, but um, coming from Stratford and then participating in the Olympics, how was it? Yeah. And, and was there a bit of sweet element? Because I know you, 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 you took silver, right? Yeah, I think Stratford, um, the London Games will always be one of my most memorable um, championships, but for many different reasons, some good, some bad. Mm. Um, I think the good part was the fact that, you know, I, I think of all the athletes that would have existed in... Sorry, this is my nephew. <laughs> I'm coming, one minute. Well, Izzy, I'm, I'm on the phone. Hold on, I'm coming. Sorry. Well, you're not on the phone, it's a laptop. <laughs> Technically. Did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so, um, London was, so from, I think, okay, I think I had many different strands because there was just a lot going on 2012. I think primarily because I grew up in Stratford, um, I'd watched the transition happen, happening in front of my eyes. Yeah. Um, I've always yeah. lived in Newham. Um, Stratford was a place, as I said, I grew up loving Stratford. I remember growing up, summers in the park, we just were outside all the time. We had bikes, we had roller skates, we had skateboards, we had, you know, we had so much fun growing up. And then obviously transitioning into secondary school where I began to feel that this town wasn't quite living up to <laughs> what I expected it to be living up to and almost um, hating it after a while. Or, you know, it just wasn't, I just didn't, it was just, it just piled in comparison to all the other towns that I'd managed to come across. And Stratford just seemed like it was well below average um, of how other places were. And then you begin to see all the cracks, you know, you see the poverty and the crime and everything else, and which you weren't seeing in other places. So um, growing, you know, in my teens, I began to not appreciate Stratford. But then obviously, um, and also just your postcode, like all my friends grew up as a, even in netball, they all grew up in leafy Essex and, and then sometimes they'd offer to drop me home. I'm like, oh, you really don't want to come here. <laughs> and then you start seeing the real difference and, you know, almost feel embarrassed. Um, so when 2012, first of all, I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't think we were going to be strong enough to get to win the bid. So when it did happen, I was thinking, okay, I'm really happy, but I don't know how you can pull this off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can pull this off. I really don't know how you can pull this off. This place is not Olympic material. I don't even like it and I live here. <laughs> 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 I don't know how you can pull this off. But, um, but then I remember, you know, when I went to Beijing and when I went to Athens, you had all these negative stories thing, yeah. before... The, the games were to kick off and people, all these naysayers. And I was thinking, well, whatever happens, the fact is that the Olympics are coming to Stratford. So we best better get behind it because this is my hometown. And if it goes poorly, we're going to take the brunt of it. <laughs> so I think from the initial shock of the fact that Stratford is punching well above, above its above its weight, I think after the initial shock, I thought, well, we have to get behind it. And I started realizing that all these naysayer stories don't always come to pass, as I saw in Beijing, as I saw in Athens. Mm. So we have to get behind it. And I thought, I don't want to be competing in the Olympics. The one Olympics, that, well, the second Olympics that come to Stratford, but the one Olympics in modern times, I don't want to be competing there when it's going to be a flop. So I have to be, I have to maintain some kind of 
mental positivity towards it and hope and pray that it does it does go well so um when it did kind of happen and i remember i was watching the opening ceremony i was because we we're in portugal mm-hmm. um training because track and field is a second week they don't like to bring us in too early okay so okay. we were in a um, holding camp in portugal while the olympics had started i remember um watching it from portugal and i called my mum in tears saying can you believe this this is a stratford <laughs> that this is stratford but this is just down the road from us yeah, this is yeah. we i know all the areas that were knocked down <laughs> to make the stadium that's where i used to go pirate radio that waterden road and all that stuff that was like that, replaced with i'm like huh it was the garages that were there that we take our cars to we know all those roads so it was really emotional it was like wow we did it like we actually we, we pulled it off because once the opening ceremony is hit you're kind of playing sailing after that you know with the competition drives the olympics but once the opening ceremony happened, it was so emotional. I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think from that, I was just proud because of the people of, for, I think I was just proud for the area. I was proud for the community that we could have something that was ours. And even if the Olympics were to disappear after that, they can't take away our memories of living in there and seeing it firsthand and seeing the changes firsthand and, you know, that will be with us forever. So that was a proud moment on a more community level um, approach. I think from a, from a personal track um, approach, um, the Olympics was special because um, it took me four years to get my act together. <laughs> the last good race prior to London was Beijing, the final in Beijing. You won gold there, right? And, yeah, where I ran gold in Beijing and then... Um, it was just four years of injury and this and headache. And, mm. and I just didn't know if I, could, I would make it in time. I really didn't know if I was going to make it. The world champs before London was uh, Daegu, South Korea, 2011. And that was supposed to be my chance that I managed to wind myself, to get myself together and compete. And I was disqualified, <laughs> full started, which just never happens. I never full start. And... It was devastating because I thought this is a one year out from the games. I've been injured for the last three years. This is the one time I've got to really um, kind of work out some kind of competitive form. So I don't know. <laughs> Leading up to 2012, yeah. I was like, I'm not sure how this is going to go down. I don't know if I've even got the confidence to keep going. Obviously, I'm going to my hometown. Um, people weren't really thinking I was going to feature in the games, which was another kind of blessing and a curse um because i was still going as defending champion from beijing but i didn't really have much support people didn't really think i was going to do anything they thought christine is she's had her time she's you know she's not going to come back so do you, do you use that kind of stuff to drive you uh, yes no i think it was a bit hurtful at first because that was my hometown and i thought no other country would treat their athlete like this even if i had you know I, I, I had no legs and no arms coming to the games. They would still, I was still defending champion coming into our hometown. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I just didn't see it happening in any other country. I've seen in other places where athletes were probably not in any good form whatsoever because they had title, because they had some kind of stock. They were held as, as, as somebody that could be respected in, in that area of sports. So it was mixed. I, I, I mean, I almost had to use it in my favor because I had no other option. I wasn't going to, you know, fall away with a towel between my legs. I had to, I had to work. Yeah. Um, but it was quite sad when I just saw that, you know, this was my home. And I, regardless of whatever, I was coming in as, you know, defending Olympic champion. <laughs> I was coming in as a, a world champion from 2007. I was coming in as a Commonwealth champion. <laughs> and I was coming to Stratford. So, um, that's what I kind of say. It was, it was a mixed bag. I really had to fight hard to get onto the radar of 2012. Okay. And then, so even though I did win a silver, I was quite happy that I, I was quite happy that I did everything I could within my, within my two hands and my two legs to really get, is it? Okay, I'm coming. One minute, I'm coming. One. 
You know, come and say hello. Come and say hello. You have to smile. Izzy, come and say hello. Izzy. He's hello. <laughs> I think it is showing off now. Um, so um, I really had to kind of work really hard to build myself back up and build my confidence back up. So every night was a silver. Um, I call it my, it was like, it was almost a gold. <laughs> Taking nothing away from the winner, but um, uh, no. So I think that's going to be one of my more memorable ones. It was one that I really, I really had to fight hard, <laughs> hard, really, really, really hard to, to get that silver medal. So yeah, bittersweet, but more sweet than bitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I feel you. Um, that, that kind of focus and discipline, do you think that would have um, allowed you to make it in any field you chose if it wasn't athletics? Definitely. I think um, our minds are just there to do the job, whatever job it is. Do you know what I mean? If you've got your mind right, it will transfer into anything else. Um, so I, I think whatever you're doing, um, you, you know, you, track is just one context. I think the contexts are different, but it's essentially you're trying to do the same thing, really. You're trying to get from A to B um, in the best way, the best shape you can, the most efficient and effective way as well. When I say fit, efficient and effective, it means that you have to almost be quite um, sensible decisions that you make. So you don't waste time, you don't waste resources. Um, you try and make the best of the opportunities you have. I think it's people always look to sports people because it's so evident a win and a loss. Yeah. Everything is so um, visible. It's so um, it's, it's so understandable. Now. Izzy, please just give me a minute. You okay. said one minute. I know, it's but a minute. I know you're right. But just give me a minute. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why he's doing this. I don't have to look after him, you know. I, need to I actually don't have to look after him. I'm doing your dad a favour. <laughs> he's coming to demand from me like I'm, I'm here to... Yeah. I don't cuss him out in front of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I definitely think Daddy it's just said, it's just a question of the Daddy context. Daddy said when it's 12 o'clock and okay. I still don't have breakfast, so breakfast is that. Okay, okay. Did you hear that? Yeah. Don't make me breakfast. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Come make me breakfast. You know? <laughs> he, this boy is so... I think it's because he's, he's got eight uncles and aunties. Uh -huh. So everyone just does no, his Tom, bidding. Tom wants to sit with you. Okay, okay. Tom wants to sit here. <laughs> this is Tom. <laughs> Tom, all right. Last question for you. I just want to... Um, so when you, when you um, hung up the spikes... How was that for you? Was that something, are you a person that can just say, look, that was then and this is now and I'm moving in this direction or did you really miss it and was it hard to deal with? Because you went, you went to study, you studied law, right? It was easy to um, retire. I think you realise, I always said that once the, once the, um, once the fire's gone, it's gone. Okay. And I think I hold oh, Izzy, hold on, you're on you're on camera, look, look. <laughs> he ran away. <laughs> um I think um I always kept on going for so long because a fire was always there. But I think I could I could comfortably say that it was it was enough. There was no other uh, the fire had gone and I, I wanted to leave before I started hating the sport and hating what I was doing and becoming resentful. And I think when you start becoming resentful and start thinking, you know, I could be doing X, Y, Z and, you know, I'm missing out on all this. I think it got to a point where um, the reasons for going were far outweighing the reason, reasons for staying. So when I left, I was quite happy to go. Um, I think it's very, very hard to put yourself in that small percent of training, like, um, you know, we can all like I still run and I and I do fitness stuff now, but to put to press yourself into that small um, area where everything's got to be precise all the time, and you've got to be sharp and you've got to be optimum fitness, and it just takes its toll. It takes its toll after a while. It really does, and it's exhausting. It's it's to live that life for so long. Um, uh, and I think with me, I only have one, one tool in the toolbox and that's a hammer. <laughs> I just go at everything hard. That's, that's me. I can't, I can't not do it any other way. I can't 
ease back. My coach was generally my, my break. That's why we worked really well together because my coach was so laid back. Um, so he would pull me back so I could go, go, go forever as well, but he would always rein me back in. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked. That was kind of our, you know, yin and yang. Um, so uh, when it got, so I tend to go really, really hard. And I, I don't know, I wasn't really, um, just was becoming a really uneasy balance. So when I did walk away, it was, it was fine. There was no coming back. And I think is I can go to the track now. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I miss it. Like my sister still trains and I miss the fact that you're able to push yourself to the extreme because that's what training is. And 400 training in particular, you push yourself to the extreme every day. Like when I look back on the work I used to do, I just don't know how I did it. I don't know. <laughs> it's, you have to be crazy to have done the work. Um, uh, so I, I miss the aspect of it. And I miss the aspect of being able to just be relentless with, with the work. And You went into doing something so different though. You know, you, you became a student again, but was you, you know, was that same ethic applied to education? I don't know what goes on in my head sometimes. I just get an idea and I just run. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think the law thing was an idea that, again, somebody had planted a seed. Um, and I think really and truly, I'm, even though I've done sport, I'm, I've always been a bit of a nerd. Like, I like studying. I, lo I just you know, I just, I love, I love that kind of mental gymnastics. Maybe that's why I love the 400 so much, because there's a lot of planning that goes into running a good 400. It's, it's like a puzzle. You know, I love puzzles. I love um, taking things apart and putting them back in. And that's what you do for the 400. So maybe that's why I enjoyed going into law because you're dealing with a whole load of puzzles and trying to figure out the best way to solve a problem. Mm. So I suppose I just put my efforts into doing what I did on the track, but doing it in a different way. So um, the law degree was to kind of set me up into going into law, yeah. which I will do, but I decided to just, ease back and not be so headstrong and trying to build Rome in one day. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I will get to law eventually, but I just need to relax and have a life, which I haven't allowed myself to do for so long. You deserve it, man. Uh, I just don't allow myself to relax and just enjoy and go out and stay up late and just eat junk and <laughs> train. Do you mean, I haven't allowed myself to do that. So I told myself that I won't go to law school this summer um, this autumn, which I plan to do, I plan to, you know, go to law school and do this and do that. And by the age of this, I would have had this and this and this and this, but I have no plan now. So I'll go to law school next year if I feel like it. Um, I mean, I will probably will go, but I've just left it open. I don't want to keep forcing myself down a routine. I think it's better. I just allow my brain to just rest and um, enjoy. And I think, you know, in a strange way, this whole COVID has been good for that. It's kind of forced me to just stop making plans <laughs> just be just yeah. chill and just um I, uh, you know I do have my areas of madness where I do do crazy things like I still do a lot of training I do boot camps and my brother does a boot camp so I go to that often I, so I still enjoy punishing myself but it's not prolonged punishment <laughs> yeah. I punish myself yeah. for a small bit then I I can you know go and have a bit of fun I go do online shopping and stuff and no, nah, you, you deserve it. And uh, yeah, Christine, I hope the no plan all goes to plan. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the first part of that plan is Izzy's breakfast. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you go. We're going to fight all day. We actually are going to fight all day. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do every time. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for speaking to me, man. I really appreciate it. And um, you've done your thing. You've represented new and well. And uh, we're proud, man. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, so we have to, um, you have to tell me a bit more about your story because I don't really know. My brothers know about you. Yeah, music's the, the thing. And I, I, um, well, I grew up in East Ham and um, yeah, just I'm, you know, 35 now, but around, around the years of, you know, 16, 17, we was, you know, doing the pipe. When I said we used to go pipe radio in Stratford, that, that was kind of us um, doing our thing. Um, and just move from there, really, and just yeah, I guess just been a part of building this scene that's kind of flourishing now, along with the other guys like Wiley and Dizzy Rascal and Lethal B, um, and yeah, I've just um, progressed since then and released my first album, two thousand and five, 
and had a um, you know I think I'm on like album album six or something now and yeah just kind of just been just navigating through the industry and just using my voice to you know what I mean speak to where I come from hopefully inspire others um, and then recently got into acting as well and done some shows like Top Boy um, and and yeah so just kind of doing that really but when when you know COVID hit and I was speaking to some charities from Newham and they're saying a lot of you know struggles that Newham already faces but then without the ability to have events and raise money and and like yeah. COVID had really hit Newham super hard so it was just about like what can I do and I just thought if I can speak to other people from here people would know about, more about us and where we come from and then yeah. hopefully kind of raise some awareness for those local charities at the same time so yeah that's all I'm yeah. trying to do. No, it's great. I think it's crazy the amount of talent that comes from Newham. Yeah. So, I didn't realise you were Newham born and bred. I really didn't realise that. But there's so much talent that's come from Newham. And I think that's saying something. I think there's something about East End that probably makes us a bit more, um, I don't know, I don't know, tougher, more resilient. I don't know, there's something because but you, when, you, when you look at how a lot of people have grown up, a lot of public figures have links to East London. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. definitely something in the water. <laughs> something in the water. All right, really. Thank you very much. No worries, Shano. Have a good day, yeah? You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.